Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to our second keynote, the first day of the Global Education Conference. We're so thrilled to have you here. I'm going to turn the time over to Lucy. Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're excited to have everybody here, and we're particularly thrilled to have Jennifer Manise with us today from the Longview Foundation. She uh, knows this space very well and is going to lend her expertise to our conference, and I know that you're going to get um, a lot out from her presentation. Um, she is the Executive Director of the Longview Foundation for World Affairs and International Understanding. Since it was found, funded, uh, founded in 1966, the Longview Foundation has been seeking to build a more peaceful, just, and sustainable world by equipping youth with a global perspective and understanding of political, social, and environmental issues worldwide. Prior to joining the Longview Foundation, Ms. Manise was the Director of Program Development and Operations at the Council of Chief State School Officers. CCSSO, which lots of ed tech people know about. Um, CCSSO is a nonpartisan nationwide nonprofit organization of public officials who head departments of elementary and secondary education in the states, the District of Columbia, the Department of Defense Education Activity, the Bureau of Indian Education, and the five U.S. extra state jurisdictions. She resides in the Metro DC area with her patient husband and two amazing daughters. And we would like to welcome you today, Jennifer. So thanks for being here. I'm going to pause my sharing and turn it over to you. Great, thanks so much, Lucy. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm just getting my screen up and let me start my presentation. So good afternoon, it's afternoon on the East Coast. And for some of you, it's evening. Welcome from wherever you are. It's a great pleasure to spend time with you today as a part of this year's Global Education Conference. And before I lose Steve and Lucy for part of this session, I just wanna thank them for their unmatched leadership in this space. It's an amazing gift for all of us to get together at this event. And I was honored to accept their invitation. Before I go too deeply into the presentation, I just wanna let you know that I'm going to throw a lot of resources at you during our time together. And I'll send you a link in the chat box. It will also be linked after the session for you to be able to access the resources that I mentioned. So in my introduction, Lucy mentioned that I've been at Longview Foundation for a while. It will actually be 10 years this February. And you've heard a bit about Longview and what we do. We're a small DC-based philanthropy that's all about building global perspectives in K-12 education in the United States. We focus our giving on three areas specifically, states and large districts to allow for the impact of significant populations of students in the United States. We also work with colleges of education to give the next generation of new educators the knowledge and skills they need to be curious about the world and to learn alongside their students. And we also work in innovations with nonprofits we're there specifically to work on new ideas and expanding something that might already be established in a small way. Because of the size of our philanthropy, we're only able to fund infusing global understanding into K-12 education in the United States. It's a pretty narrow mission and we're the only foundation we know uh, that does this specific work. Our mission helps keep the focus on what we do uh, at the deepest levels of change in the United States. Districts, states, and nonprofits serving significant numbers of students across the nation. So let me welcome you. That's my welcome page. Um, something that global education shares in the United States with other countries is that it takes a lot of work to do it well, especially when you're getting started. And so for the next 30 minutes or so, I'd like to share some of the lessons I've learned in my 10 years at Longview and share some of the resources that I think have really been impactful to the work overall. But before we get started there, let's think for a minute. You know, this work is complicated. You take time out of your downtime to really invest in it. And why, why do we all do this work? 
So last year I was presenting with an educator from DC Public Schools, Julian Hipkins, who's an amazing educator. And when we were starting our session, he referenced Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why. And do you know your why? I really like to think about my why and talk a little bit about my why when I'm setting the context for the work. Let's begin first with Bill Breeze's why. Mr. Breeze started Longview a long time ago. As Lucy mentioned, it began in 1966. Mr. Breeze's in thinking was greatly influenced by his exposure in World War I as a young boy. His father, who had been brought up in England, was killed in an explosion in Northern France in 1915. Soon after, his mom volunteered as an ambulance driver. Housed with a French family, Bill would go to the nearby hospital to push wounded veterans outside in their wheelchairs to get some fresh air. After that, he grew up and went back to Europe for World War II, and then after the war, engaged in nation building. Uh, a few years later, when the UN was getting going, he volunteered his services and was being paid a dollar a year. While he was at the UN, he was good friends with none other than Eleanor Roosevelt. He wanted to do something specific around the global sharing and respect for human life and rights. And he knew that adults pretty much at that point were a lost cause. Many of them were damaged by the war. They were really um, impacted by all that they had seen and experienced and were just really trying to survive at that time. So Eleanor, knowing that Bill wanted to do something good, told him he needed to work on the next generation, specifically in the United States. The starting place to change attitudes was in children, in a classroom setting within public schools. So I think that's a pretty amazing reason for why Bill Brees got involved with global education. My why is slightly less glamorous. This is actually the street that I grew up on in New Hampshire. My town was about 2000 and pretty much everybody looked like everybody else. The first time I ever went to a big city was New York when I was in eighth grade. And when I first felt the hum and looked around and saw the diversity and smelled and heard all of the diversity, I knew that I was never going to be satisfied living in a small town. That was my first why. And then when I was older and more established in my career and headed over to schools in China with CCSSO, it was my second why, seeing education in an international perspective and seeing all the lessons that could be learned and all of the connections that could be made between people oh, I'm not really oh, impacted my why. Hey, Lucy, you're not muted, I don't think. This is, um, this is my second why. Um, these are my daughters and listening to their conversations with their peers about big global issues makes me hopeful for the next generation's ability to tackle issues of global significance in a way that my generation hasn't. I think this comic, the last, um, last Saturday in the Washington Post sums it up well, where we see the daughter talking about the great work being done on global warming and the mom thinking about how when she was 16, she was more concerned with genes. But I do have a lot of hope in the next generation as having a significant impact on the why. So you've heard Mr. Breeze's why, and you've heard my why, so let's hear your whys. You can either type them into the webinar chat, hopefully you know how to use your Zoom webinar chat box, or you can go ahead and just put them into Twitter with the hashtag GlobalEd19. But what is your why for really investing in global education, either from a nonprofit standpoint or from a school leader standpoint or from a teacher standpoint? What is your why? Do you share it with the group? And then think about who you can share it with in person after today. Okay, now that we've talked a little bit about what and why, let's talk about how and what. So we all know that planning is important. For the next three days, you're gonna have the opportunity to be exposed to some amazing ideas. Ooh, equitable access to education. Thanks, LFA, that's a great one. Otherwise, are there a wise in the chat box? Keep typing them in and I will look at them as time goes on. Ah, the moral imperative. Thanks, Joanne, that's a good one too. 
schools do need to be relevant and students do need to have agency around their learning. Keep typing and I'll try not to be too distracted, but I'll try and keep going. But why does planning matter? Well, you need to take time and think through what you want to accomplish or disaster may strike halfway through. So as you're going to this global education conference and attending all these amazing sessions, you're gonna be hit with so many possibilities, so many amazing ideas of things that you might wanna implement. Keep a list of them, keep a notebook close by, write them down, and then as you're considering all of this and when you're thinking about your planning, take time to think who can support your efforts. What can rise to the top as something that can be practically done on the sooner end? What takes more time to plan and will need to engage more people from either your, your professional learning team or your building or your district, but really think through and take the time to plan. To do any of these things well, planning and professional development is critical. You're gonna have questions about where to begin and you're gonna need partners and organizations that can support you. Some of the professional development needs to come for you personally, and that comes through doing great learning experience, either one-time work or even online courses like those offered by Primary Source or World Sa Savvy. Or you might wanna just go ahead and read some books on global competence. The speaker later on tonight at 6 p.m., has written a great book. And if you haven't had enough of global competence yet at this point in the day, tune back in at six because Jennifer will have great things to share with you. Or maybe you just wanna start with some simple exposure exercises. Radio Garden, Google Maps over time are two very simple ways to engage students in global thinking and understanding how the world is rapidly changing. Uh, one great Google, Google Maps exercise is to take somewhere that's hosted the Olympics and look at the satellite footage over time and how the community has changed and just kind of talk about those exposures with your students. Another fantastic resource that gets highlighted a lot in this meeting are the UN Sustainable Development Goals. All of these are great representations of different reasons that students can engage in global issues that are also really important locally. If you wanna move beyond exposure, take time to think through and plan how the work you're going to propose will engage your students in something that matters to them. What learning will you hope to accomplish? How will students demonstrate their learning and how will they communicate their learning to a broader audience? Networking is something that's also made a big difference for me personally and professionally, and it can have a big impact on your work too. Networking has allowed me to better understand the field, learn what was happening, and where there were gaps that Longview could fill. One of the great projects that we've been involved with is the Global Teacher Education Network, uh, the fellowship program that we run. That didn't happen through Longview strategically planning to start a teacher education fellowship, but rather it started through a collaboration with a nonprofit grantee that we had supported that was no longer interested in running the fellowship program. So when Longview assumed that role, we had the opportunity to work with professors from colleges of education from around the US to add global learning outcomes to their coursework, learn from experts, be mentored, and infuse global learning, present on it, and take on more responsibility in their colleges of education. Watching that network flourish and knowing that that happened as a result of our network was extremely exciting. Take the opportunity to network as you are attending these sessions, participate in the chats, follow up on LinkedIn and through Twitter and make connections both within your discipline and beyond. Some of the greatest network connections I've made um, go way beyond the traditional global education network. And it's important that we don't just continue to communicate within our audiences, but that we continue to reach out to our colleagues that may not be as um, much of an insider on why global education matters so much to the next generation. So keep in mind, the path isn't always obvious, but please do 
uh, keep on networking. All right, next up, learning. How to do it well. How to intend, how do you intend to apply what you're learning? Especially when so many of you are already so great at this work and especially when you're so busy already. I'll let you know that one of my secrets is my active curiosity. It's been instrumental in my career and it's also been instrumental in um, how my trajectory has changed over time. Going from an organization that supports K-12 education across the United States into global education is solely due to curiosity. And I promise to tell you the story of what Parma Ham and the oldest living Confederate widow had to do with my promotions and hires over the years. Did you know that the curiosity that you're actively displaying in your current position can lead to your next position or even the one after that? Do you carve out time to put interest into your professional learning beyond what will be required in your career? How do you choose the sessions that you attend at conferences? Is it because you know a ton about the topic or is it because you know next to nothing about the topic? Keeping curiosity at the center of your practice is critical, not only for classroom teachers, but also for those who work in the nonprofit space. If you display an enthusiasm for your topic and learn alongside your colleagues or your students, you're modeling a long, lifelong healthy habit while you're making learning experiences more enjoyable for those around you. So while it's kind of silly to have to say out loud, put a professional learning plan in place. In some instances, teachers are already required to do this, but for those of you who might not be in the classroom anymore, how strategic are you in planning out your professional development? What opportunities are you looking for? What books can you read? What do you want to learn about? Uh, one of my favorite people to learn from right now is Adam Grant out of the Penn, the University of Pennsylvania Business School. He was one of the professors behind the Warby Parker team and has been writing about life in work and how they intersect for a few years now. He has a great podcast, um, but just looking for people that are interesting and that speak to you maybe outside of your professional career is a great way to continue to grow. Oh gee, I forgot to show you my um, Rachel White Reed bookshelves. Um, so just know that all of the pictures that I'm showing you for the most part are pictures of different art exhibits that I have visited. Um, I note all of the places at the end. This is Rachel White Reed. Um, and these are actually, this is um, a negative space of library shelves. So she does the air around spaces and so the books were there and she essentially cast all the places that the books were. Uh, but she's a great artist out of the UK. Um, you'll see other artists as we go along. Okay, moving on to listening. Okay, listening is so important and many of you already know that. There's a great movement afoot around um, listening circles. A great resource is coming out, or no, just came out this summer from Darla Deardorff at Duke University. A manual for developing intercultural competencies through story circles. And she did this in collaboration with UNESCO. Uh, so many of us um, are great listeners, and so many of us have a lot to learn about how to be good listeners. But story circles specifically create opportunities for intercultural connections between listeners. As Deerdorf describes it, circle processes provide a non-threatening way in which individuals can share their personal experiences and explore similarities as well as differences. Uh, this has been really popular in Canada and Darla's been using it around the world, but there's a great new resource that she just published this summer on this. Uh, another resource around listening is of course the global competency definition that the OECD used for, to assess uh, global competence in PISA last year. I'm sure that many of you are very familiar with this definition, uh, but I think just remembering to that you have a perspective and that your perspective is different and learning how to communicate beyond your perspective is so very critically important and listening is absolutely key. So speaking out, uh, seeking out other perspectives and listening well um, are two great things that I've seen grantees do over the past 10 years. 
some other resources that we have developed are around leading and learning well for educators. Uh, the graphic on the left with a very small writing is the global learning continuum that we actually funded UNC Chapel Hill to produce and ASCD then acquired uh, and is available for free on their site for educators to look at different levels of global learning, where they are, and what resources they can use to extend their ability to put global learning into the classroom. The resource on the right is a book that we published last year around education leadership, and it's really a framework and lots of checklists around whether you're an emerging leader, whether you're a fairly secure leader, or whether you're ready to deeply dive into full immersion of global competence within your school. And it follows the leadership standards that were published by CCSSO. So uh, those are some great resources for listening and leading and learning well. Now, not everything has to be a huge framework or project. Um, sometimes simple thinking routines can make a big difference. For those of you who aren't familiar with the work out of Project Zero at Harvard University, they've done these great thinking routines. There are some great common thinking routines around, um, I used to think, now I think, but they've also got some great global routines as well. Why does this matter to me? Why does this matter to my community? And why does it matter to the world? It's a wonderful opportunity to um, really take those SDG goals and talk them through with your students uh, based upon what their interests are and have them think about what's happening in the community and what's happening in the world as well. So our next thing is really around casting a wide net. Um, we've talked about lots of different experiences at lots of different levels. There's also good resources, but extending to a broader community is vital to extending this work beyond just those who've already been committed to it. Uh, one teacher that I had the great experience to know um, in New York, Tara Beresik, used to take her students to school board meetings and have them present on the work that they were doing. Um, she was great at getting her kids to go abroad and experience different um, cultures and do service projects and do real learning. And one of their first stops when they came back was always to the school board to talk about um, where they had been, what they did, and where they wanted to go next. North Carolina um, has been really a role model for this in taking their district leaders and state legislators abroad for quite a number of decades. And the result of that work is that they have global ready distinctions, not only for educators, but also for schools and districts in North Carolina. They have a rigorous assessment model and they are putting global ready distinctions on schools across the state. Another um, great group is the Illinois Global Scholar Certificate. And a few teachers, Randy Smith, Seth Brady, and a few other teachers cast a really wide net when they set out to create their certificate program. It's a distinction for high school students that wanna dig deeply into better understanding the world. Students have created all kinds of great projects. Um, it's a capstone project after a set of courses and students have done things like create an app for rating the quality of study abroad programs, or another student wrote legislation regarding accessibility for healthcare in Illinois. Another one did a checklist for Ebola exposure, uh, and someone else did public service announcements in Nepal around landslide risk, uh, but all kinds of great information for those students. And really digging in deeply. And those kids also have to present to a broader audience. So it's just wonderful to see what can happen when you extend your network beyond people that it's easy to have these conversations with, 
Um, and it's also amazing to see the transformation in students. So putting project-based learning into the student processes um, can be somewhat complicated. And I wanted to go ahead and share this resource from Asia Society and encourage you to Google it. There are some good articles on this. But the SAGE approach to project-based learning really emphasizes student choice and authentic work. Um, but what I'm really interested in in the SAGE work is that the students are always keeping that ex exhibition to the external audience um, at the front and center of how they are putting their projects together. In the past, when I've talked to educators about putting project-based learning into the classroom, they said that sometimes students weren't really as engaged with it because they felt like it was taking away from their preparation for tests or um, how was it really meaningful. But when you add that exhibition to an external audience, students tend to take that pretty seriously. And I'm gonna actually go back up to um, the sustainable development goals again. Uh, but these give you an opportunity for students to, an easy exercise is to put them up on the wall, have kids walk around the room and take a look at them, um, decide which one they wanna focus on, and then look at it from, again, the local perspective, and the global perspective and really take the issues on. Uh, again, looking at the chat, I see that some of you are writing down, um, writing down some notes. Thanks for the other Adam Grant fans in the audience. But has anybody in the audience used SDGs and how did your students respond? Did you use them for project-based learning? Go ahead and share them so that your, your peers can see what you've done. Or if you have links to your projects, go ahead and put those in there. Um, and then did they exhibit to an authentic audience? Did you have them take it beyond the classroom and maybe share with other classrooms in your building or even um, an audience outside of your building? Anybody want to share that? If you're new to them, a great way to get engaged with the SDG goals is to use the world's largest lesson. There are lots of great resources on there. Um, but you know, really just take your time and do what makes sense. Don't go big if you don't feel like you're ready. Um, you can start with a simple discussion. You can start with something as simple as the radio station or uh, the Google Maps and build from there. Or you can do um, the global read aloud is another opportunity to kind of dip your toe in and not go full flog on global if you're not quite ready. I'm not seeing anybody type in. So Jennifer, there are a couple of people who've raised their hands. Oh yeah. And so I'm wondering if you want to, maybe we can promote them to panelists if they wanted to ask a question. Those of you who did raise your hands, would you let us know in the chat that that was your intention? Yes, absolutely. I'd be very happy to hear the, the examples. Okay, so I'm gonna make Ed a panelist. Hopefully that's what you wanted, Ed. And if so, you can turn your mic on and say hi. Hi, Ed, are you there? While we're waiting, I'm gonna just say that the program in Illinois is called Illinois Global Scholar, Marlena. And Marilyn, you raised your hand, so I gave you permission. Did you wanna turn your mic on? The lower left of your screen. Hi, Marilyn. Yay, how are you? Good. Um, I'm tuning in from Victoria, Melbourne, Victoria, Australia. It's 8 a.m. here on, uh, on uh, what day? Tuesday. Um, I'd like to mention something I did for the Victorian government here in Australia, and that was to align um, global projects around the world on offer from various places. Um, to the Victorian curriculum, so they're available online, but they, um, of course, could involve anybody anywhere. Um, but I've just drawn them up to the Victorian curriculum standards, um, their content descriptors, and their expectations from people in uh, classrooms here in Melbourne, uh, in Victoria, rather. So, but they're available to anybody, and a lot of the projects emanate from um, from the USA. 
Oh, that's good to know they're there. Um, it might be interesting for other educators to take advantage of them and do a compare and contrast. Yes, it would be good. I'll get the link for you and put it up online, okay? Oh, that would be wonderful. Thank you for sharing. No Paula, do you want to talk a little bit around your work on campa campaigning around plastic and responsible consumerism? Oh, I see somebody did something with sea turtles too. While I'm in presentation mode, I can't scroll through the chat. I can only see the most recent chat things. I so just made Paula a, a panelist. So Paula, you now have permissions. You need to turn your mic on and your video on at the lower left of your screen. Oh, I should turn my video on too, huh, Steve? All right. That'd be fun. Actually, I don't know if I can. Here Go ahead, Paula. Paula. Hi, how are you? Greetings from Ireland. Um, I'm part of a group called Global Citizenship School and we regularly run campaigns around such issues as plastic, um, around homelessness, around poverty. And a lot of these campaigns we would organise around St. Patrick's Day. So because it's the 17th of March, we try and tie in the 17 sustainable goals in with the 17th of March. So we always have... A, a sort of a green aspect to that. So our our ultimate aim is to is to embed global citizenship into the Irish Irish curriculum. That's the plan. And how have the students responded to it? The students respond wonderfully well to it. So because we're under the auspices of our national union, we get we get a lot of traction with it and um, I suppose we would get a lot of media coverage and we're currently developing our own resources and lesson plans um, on the website. So maybe I, I could, could send those details to someone? Yes, if you can put a link into the chat box, that would be wonderful. I'm sure we would love to see what you've been up to. Absolutely. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Oh, thanks, Marilyn, for that link. That would be a really fun compare contrast. All right, well, I think I'm gonna go ahead and keep moving um, and we'll maybe have some more time for a discussion at the end, but I'd love to continue to hear your ideas and for you to hear each other's ideas because in my mind, you all are the experts and I'm just the witness to your greatness. Oh, here's that sage. All right, that we already talked about. So let's move on to reflection. Now, um, I've kind of alluded to this earlier in my presentation, um, but when you're reflecting on what works and what doesn't, I strongly encourage you to go out of your comfort zone and ask people who may not uh, be regular folks to get feedback from for their feedback. One way that we've done this at Longview recently um, we did some strategic planning last year. And of course we asked our grantees, uh, and of course we asked our partners, and of course we asked our, our non-funding partners, but we also asked people who had never gotten a dollar from Longview, even people that had asked for dollars and not gotten them to really help us do our work better. And that's not an easy thing to do, to ask people, um, who may not be the happiest with the decisions or the conversations that you've had for feedback on how to do your work, work well. But I really think that um, it's critical to making sure that you're improving to the best that you can be. And it's definitely helped us really think about how we fund, what we fund, and what we need to do differently. How we need to extend the network of people that work with Longview uh, beyond where it is right now. Because honestly, if we keep things the way they are, we'll never get global into the water. And one of my favorite analogies for this is that for so very long, global education was considered sort of the foam on top of the cappuccino, where you could either get your cappuccino with foam or without foam. And what we really want is for this to be a cup of tea that is infused across all areas of the curriculum. Global education isn't an after-school activity. It's not 
a thing that you do for a couple of weeks as part of a social studies unit. It really should inform all parts of the school day and it should be a part of the entire school building in the entire school district, in the entire state or province, in the entire country, across the world. Because we're talking about the future of kids. And I think Mr. Breeze was really on to something when he really decided to invest his efforts on behalf of children. So when you're reflecting about the success of your work, cast that net broadly with regard to feedback. And then think about your connections this week. Think about who you're meeting, who you're connecting with on Twitter, LinkedIn, um, but then also think about who you can tell about this conference as it's going on in your buildings, in your offices, um, in your professional networks around your discipline. Um, do get the word out. And the more people that we have engaging, creating, presenting, and really working on behalf of this issue, the lighter the load becomes for all of us. Um, I'm so grateful for this shared network, but let's make this conference three times its size next year and even larger the year after that. Okay, so let's pause and consider where you are, how you got to where you are today. And sometimes we don't stop and look at the grandeur around us and look at where we've come from and what we've accomplished. And I just want to take a moment to celebrate where you are and the fact that you're here. And I'd like for you to think about that as well. Um, how you got to care about global education, how you became an advocate for global education and what you hope to accomplish in the future. Uh, it's worth reflecting on and being grateful for all that you've accomplished. I have to admit that I drove up to this Vista. I did not actually hike here. And then let's go back to Eleanor Roosevelt. We talked about her at the beginning. I'm hoping to have a great conversation at the end here. So I'm gonna leave quite a bit of time for questions and comments and feedback. But um, we, we started with Eleanor Roosevelt telling Breeze that he, Mr. Breeze that he needed to focus on the youth and the children in schools and classroom. And Eleanor Roosevelt has this quote that you are here today because of the choices you made yesterday. And so my challenge to you as I finish up the prepared remarks of this, purport, this presentation is if you are here today because of the choices you made yesterday, where do you intend to be tomorrow? Think about that and let's chat about what we can do. This is my contact information. Um, please do feel free to follow me on Twitter and check out the resources that's on lo the Longview site, longviewfoundation.org. And I'm gonna go ahead and take myself out of presentation mode, although I'll keep the slides up um, in case anybody has any questions about any of them specifically. Uh, but um, I would love to get into more conversation about things that you heard in this presentation that you have further questions on or general questions about global education. Thanks again to Lucy and Steve for the amazing work that they do in putting this whole thing together. Uh, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to spend this time with you. So thanks, Lucy and Steve. And let's go ahead and get to comments and questions. All right, so I'm out of that, so I can scroll through here. Let's start at the top here. If you have questions, you can put them in the chat. Or as you've seen previously, you can raise your hand. And if you're brave and raise your hand, we'll give you the ability to turn your webcam on and your microphone on. I'm loving all of these whys. Thank you so much for sharing these great reasons. I hope that you all have taken time to read each other's whys. Oh, now that I am not in presentation mode, I can also turn my camera on. Hold on. Oh, it's kind of dark in here. Sorry about that. Hi, everybody. It's me. I should go turn on a light. Hang on. Any hands raised, Steve? Or oh, I see more messages. Oh, 
Oh, we've got some links. Great. Ah, so how do you engage classmates who might not be interested? That is a great question. Um, Jennifer, somehow you got muted. I did that. Um, I was stopping my video feed because I can't actually get up to turn on the light right now. Sorry about that, everyone. It's twilight here. Um, so I'm a student. The class we learn about, my classmates don't seem to see the purpose. And how would I get them interested? I would think about starting where they are. You know, what are they interested in? And what can you find that's global about what they're interested in? Um, pretty much it's tough to find a topic that you can't make global. And Steve, I wonder what you think about this, but like, let's just say they're interested in sports and maybe they're obsessed with soccer or hockey or football. What's global about that and start there so that they can see about the global impact implications for something that they're already interested in. I, you, I'm gonna, oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you great. And I have an answer, but let me know when you're ready. Okay, I'm just gonna finish up with, um, let's talk about the NBA for just one quick second and how a tweet led to a really tumultuous couple of weeks with another country um, that that wasn't happy with the tweet that, that was sent out by one of the teams here in the United States. Suddenly, basketball became a huge global issue, um, which I'm guessing that, if, that a few days before, many kids who followed a lot of basketball weren't thinking about how global it was. Steve, what do you think? Well, I think that was a great example because it revealed the, <coughs> excuse me, it revealed the complexity, right? The, the financial interest versus the moral or political interests and the, the way in which now that, that finances are in, intertwined across nations do, and companies do, how careful do you have to be and can you say what you really think? And so my answer was going to be, maybe still is, that I think kids are hungry for the truth and, and they feel like they go to school and they absorb a lot and they're told a lot, <clears throat> but I think they really want to understand the world. I'm so sorry, I had a cough there and I had to come out. I think kids want to understand the world. And so there's so much interesting going on that's so complex right now that part of what we've noticed, at least I've noticed, is we avoid certain topics because they are highly politicized and we don't really know what's going on, right? So Ukraine and Syria and all of these places, Bolivia and Venezuela, <clears throat> these are all really, really important, interesting things to talk about. So I feel like it's valuable to have really good, honest conversations and say, here's what we know and here's what we don't know. And this is a complicated world. And, and at least I can tell you from the kids I talk to, they're hungry for someone to, to speak candidly with them. I agree. And I think that it's also important that we not pose ourselves as experts, but rather as fellow learners because I feel a lot more comfortable talking about the situation in Ukraine as a fellow learner than ever trying to present myself on an expert uh, basis with that completely complex situation. So that's a great example. Thank you so much. Are there other questions or other hands raised? I'm scrolling while we look. Wait, we've got a hand up. Let me find it. I have to scroll up and down to find it. It is Maha. Maha, I'm making you a panelist. And then Maha, look for the microphone and video at the bottom left. Jennifer, I loved your clarification on that. Yeah, speaking honestly doesn't mean you're telling that you, that you know things. Oftentimes it's, hey, some of these issues are so complex, it takes years. Uh, we had a daughter who lived in Nepal and I went to visit her and a guy took me aside and he said, because she was working for a humanitarian organization, he said, you could live here for 50 years and you might still not really understand us. And I said, you know what, you're right. And thank you for reminding me. Yes. 
Baha, we're ready yes, to hear um, you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's great to, uh, to, to, to listen to your talk today. Thank you very much for bringing up these ideas. And uh, I would like to share um, uh, one of uh, the projects they have done. I teach at the Faculty of Economics and Politics. I teach the foundation here. Uh, I give them language. General English. So, uh, by the uh, during their study, they uh, study some uh, terms, political and economic terms. So, uh, by the end of the term, we give them a project where they can think of a project that they can benefit their fellow colleagues, and then they have uh, they have to make a whole plan for it, a budget and a plan, and uh, how to go do a marketing plan and uh, prepare the stuff that are going to. Uh, work together and they have to give us uh, uh, a review of all this and then they have to sit in, in uh, the supposedly investors, they are their colleagues again, uh, and they have to convince them to give them money. So we put them in the, into the uh, two situations. The fir first, uh, that they have to uh, forget about being personal and to think about their own small society inside the college and then to think bigger what if you'd like to even make that um, a real project and really do it on the ground so I believe that I, to help the students and this is a, as a kind of um, a reaction to the question that one of uh, our colleagues here mentioned before that sometimes the students is it's not the idea that they don't want to share uh, or to understand about uh, different cultures. The idea is that they don't understand the importance of being aware of their own society and how to share in them. So if uh, we help them to understand how to share and care about their own society, on the long run, we can help them to think uh, much wider about the global society. Oh, thank you, Maha. That's very well said. Thank you. So Paula mentions the challenges around engaging colleagues and how there's always one person that's on the team that advocates on behalf of global. Um, and I see that time and time again, Paula. I totally agree with you. It looks like we're, um, we're getting some links to what you're suggesting around learning to read the world. Um, so thank you for adding those in. And um, yes, I think, that's where listening is so very important because in those conversations with colleagues, you can find ways to thread in, in a meaningful way, in an authentic way, um, why global matters. Because I think if you dig in deep enough, you'll find that they care about the kids that they want to work with and prepare for the future. And part of preparing them for the future is preparing them for global society, global economies, global jobs, global communities. And it's not just about uh, the economic benefit of being prepared to work in a global society. It's really about being a good neighbor, a good citizen, um, a good community member, and a respectful community member. Uh, we have so much to learn on respect and empathy. And so I'm glad that we've got the resource as well. Ah, collaboration for projects between students in different countries. A great question. Thank you so much, Tatiana. Um, there are some wonderful organizations that support exchanges, um, virtual exchanges and in-person exchanges. And there's all kinds of ways to do that. I'm actually, if I can do it real quick, I might actually pull up the resources that I, um, that I have prepared for you all. First off, let me type in, that should take you to the resources that I'm about to show you. I'm gonna pull this up and show you that we have a list of, um, these are all the things that I mentioned during the presentation right up front here. So if you want to learn more about Illinois Global Scholar, you can click on that link right there. But then I've gone ahead and put in some curriculum instruction and assessment resources. I've put in some global connections and classroom collaboration. And this gets to your question, Tatiana. So Empatico, ePals, Global Nomads, Generation Global, are all wonderful resources. 
Um, here's some other ones, the Global Reader Loud, I think I mentioned in my presentation. Um, just all kinds of ways that you can do exchanges virtually, Skype in the classroom. Uh, the Stevens Initiative works with um, communities it, that are predominantly Muslim that are exchanging virtually with schools in the United States. You can do pen pal schools. There's worldwide schools. I, there's just lots of resources that you can do. Um, oh, one that I didn't mention in the presentation that I'll go ahead and mention right now is a grantee of ours, Worlds of Words, out of the University of Arizona. Uh, they have this amazing resource, wowlit.org, that has some online journals and works around specifically um, reading for early childhood, for elementary education, and for high school. A lot of uh, great young adult literature here. Um, and it, I heard the, the founder and um, director of Worlds of Words last week, and she was talking about how important it is to uh, read not only for pleasure, but also as a social responsibility to better understand cultures and to become more aware of global issues. And she was just um, really highlighting the value of YA fiction from other countries. So Wild Lit is a great resource on that. I meant to mention them, I apologize that I didn't. Uh, but it's a great way to dig deeply into a culture and go beyond, as my friend Demetria at IU always likes to say, foods, flags, festivals, famous people and fashion. So not just the foods, flags, and festivals, but also famous people and fashion. And so many times our understanding of another culture kind of ends there, but literature as a way to engage deeply in story and um, to really understand more about the issues that a culture might be facing. Okay, are there other questions that we have or comments that people would like to be promoted? Uh, Pulitzer Center is a great resource. Oh, micro-credentials out of Digital Promise. That's another wonderful way for you all to learn as educators. There's a certificate program that World Savvy started that's a graduate level certificate program around global competence. Highly recommend that. I mentioned primary source. If you want to better make the case and you live in the United States, Mapping the Nation is a fantastic resource that we co-developed with Asia Society to look at the economics, the demographics, and the education aspects that are global for every county in the United States. You heard that right, every county in the United States. So again, you have this resource here in the chat. Go ahead and link on it, and it will also be linked to the presentation after the fact if you want to go back and take a look at it. Steve, are there other questions or hands raised that we need to acknowledge? I'm not seeing them. Um... But if you put a question in the chat and it scrolled by us and we missed it, please feel free to ask it. We'll probably finish in about two minutes so that you have a time to take a break and get ready for the next set of sessions. Um, but you can also raise your hand and we'll let you take the microphone. Okay, and hopefully you can see the link that I just shared for the PDF that's uh, like three comments up at this point. So you should be able to copy and paste it into your browser. And as Jennifer said, we'll put that with the recording of her session. Okay, that was super. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. And if you haven't had enough Global Ed today, I can't speak highly enough about Jen Klein's session in two hours. I guess it's only an hour away now. She's an expert. Uh, her work is amazing, and you will learn so much from her. So if you, there's a chance, please, 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 Check back in in an hour, go grab yourself a cup of tea or whatever, and keep going on the Global Education Conference. And thanks one more time to Lucy and to Steve for their amazing vision. Let's let, actually, let's go back up. Can we get back up to the um, Grand Canyon? Steve, 15 years ago, would you have imagined yourself as um, being here today, <laughs> doing all this work? I'm guessing not. So I hope you take a moment on the Grand Canyon and just think about all you have accomplished because it's all I, up to you guys. I think the magic moment for me and Lucy was the first year holding the conference, 
that it all worked. And it's hard to believe it now, but at the time, it was phenomenal to have people gathering from all over the world. And all the links worked and the technology worked and we were shocked. And it was just so exciting and we've made so many friendships. So yes, I'm not sure I could have imagined this exact place, but I am an optimist and I am deeply interested in global. So, so maybe I was hoping for this as I was down at the, at the, at the, on the river, not having yet the full view, but yeah. Well, congratulations and thanks again. And thank you everyone for participating today. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks everybody. Those of you who were able to watch in the YouTube stream, so glad that you did. Take care now. Bye. Bye.